we are giving them some of their own medicine. We have to beat them at their own game right now and out-message them, out-fox them, and frankly, out-argue them, out-persuade. We cannot play by different rules than the Republicans if we are to beat them. So here at Pondering Politics, we said in 2024, we would do some things differently, particularly as we get closer to the election. And I wanted to have conversations with interesting people. And I bagged an interesting person. I have Congressman Dan Goldman of New York's 10th District. Congressman, I appreciate you uh, popping in and answering questions. How are you? Great to be with you. And um, I'm, I'm hanging in there. It's a little chaotic in D.C. and has been for 16, 17 months. So, but we're, uh, we're trudging through. I wonder what happened in those 16 or 17 months that caused the chaos. Would it be fair to say that the chaos began in January, 2023, something like that, maybe? Perhaps 15 speaker votes and Kevin McCarthy essentially uh, selling everything that he had control of in order to uh, become speaker only to then be Uh, removed in part because he gave so much power to the extreme right of his party in order to become speaker. But yes, that certainly did not set things off on on a good note. Well, Congressman, to be fair, I mean, former Speaker McCarthy, he made history, right? He had one of the most historically short tenures of any speaker in U.S. congressional history. I mean, he got his name in the history books. Are you really going to begrudge him that? He he certainly did through uh, means I'm sure he would prefer not to have done, including requiring 15 votes to become speaker and then uh, being one of the the only speakers to have ever been vacated by by his own party. Well, it's looking increasingly likely that uh, he won't be alone for very long. Uh, the sword of Damocles hangs over uh, Speaker Mike Johnson as we speak. And uh, I mean, obviously, we have a lot to talk about, but I suppose um, I will start with actually, let me start with this first, because and then we'll get into the the current state of chaotic politics with the Republican Party. So you ran for Congress in 2022. You were seated in 2023. You are a freshman Democrat part, in, in my opinion, of a very robust class of freshman Democrats. And we're going to get into that because I love the energy that you're bringing prior to that. You know, I knew of you when you were the lead counsel of the first impeachment effort against then President Trump. So I guess my first question is, having had a taste of of Congress at that time as an attorney and not a sitting member, what the hell made you want to get into politics on a formal level? Are you a glutton for punishment? Did you lose a bet? What's what's going on? It's a very, very good question. And all all of those might apply. But in, in truth, um, I, I did not have interest in in running for Congress when I left uh, as a as a counsel here on the staff. And I went back to my family in New York City. I thought, all right, Donald Trump was not convicted by the Senate, but they even conceded the Republicans that we proved our case that Donald Trump abused the power of his office and they wanted to let the voters decide. So I thought, all right, let's the, let the voters decide. Hopefully Joe Biden wins and Donald Trump rides his golf cart into the sunset. Uh, Obviously, uh, the first part of that happened, but the second part certainly did not. And so by the time 2022 rolled around, uh, two, about a year and a half after January 6th, and then to not only have January 6th occur, but to see the Republican Party Uh, just completely fold uh, underneath Donald Trump even after January 6th. Uh, An open seat, uh, a seat opened up, I should say, in my district. And I thought, you know, if I'm I'm going to get back in the arena, if I am going to continue the work that I started by trying to hold Donald Trump accountable, trying to hold the uh, MAGA wing of the Republican Party, which now controls the Republican Party accountable, um, I I have to do this and see if I can get back down to Washington and and use the experience that I had both as a prosecutor for 10 years and then as the lead impeachment counsel going up against Jim Jordan and folks like that to uh, to do whatever I can to make sure that we preserve and protect our democracy and the rule of law. 
Would you say that uh, your experience and, and skill as a prosecutor and as an attorney have lent themselves well as a lawmaker, a legislator, somebody who's now, I mean, you are now acting in the capacity of Congress, not the justice system. Do you think there's a lot of transferable skill there? Do you think, think you were well equipped for it? I actually, I, I do. For sure, there's there's obvious um, transferable skills in terms of the investigations that the Republicans have been <laughs> trying to execute, and I use trying uh, intentionally uh, with two complete sham impeachment investigations and uh, my Secretary Mayorkas, President Biden. I've been on the both of those committees, and so I've been able to use my experience um, to really, uh, I, I think, do the best I can to poke to not only poke holes, uh, which is not that hard because the holes are gaping in their investigation, but also to aggressively message um, and to be in a position where because I understand impeachment, because I understand investigations and how they should be run, I have more confidence than some of my colleagues in calling out their um, their farcical efforts. Um, but on the legislative side, I will say uh, it has been much more helpful than I I might have thought. And uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, as a lawyer, um, you're you're trained to be creative um, in, in certainly as a prosecutor in the Southern District of New York. I was trained to be very aggressive and you're also trained to uh, take head on some of the opposing arguments. And so what I've found is that there's a real opportunity to be creative and to think a little bit outside the box, which you would do, you know, as a lawyer, um, and also to then be able to think about, all right, what is the objection to this policy that I believe in? Um, I'll take uh, renewable energy as an example. So uh, Democrats, of course, uh, want renewable energy for many reasons, including to curb the uh, excessive rate of, of climate change that is going to burn up our planet. Republicans, uh, as we know, don't care about that. Either they don't believe it, they're in denial, or they just don't care. But what they do talk about a lot is energy independence and being independent from relying on Russia, Iran, China, our enemies, which we have to do in the global oil market. If you truly want to be energy independent, then why are we not building and creating our own energy at home with renewable energy? And so I try to think about things that way, which is to say, all right, I'm not going to convince them that climate change is the reason they should get behind this. But I can find a reason that they can get behind it that's different from my reason necessarily, although in this case, I also agree with it, but it might be able to persuade them. And so the idea of uh, thinking about things in a, in, a, in a model of persuasion is something you're trained to do as a lawyer. And I think that's been very helpful. Well, to your point, I mean, it's almost like who cares about the motivation as long as you can get them to the right destination, even if, you know, appealing to Republican elected officials, let's say that you would just have to appeal to base finances. Listen, on just a sheer cynical financial level, it's in America's best interest to lean into renewable energy. Uh, you know, as much as we love altruism, who cares as long as they ultimately get on board with the right side of things in the end? So I think that that's an excellent point. I'll also point out that uh, because this is something uh, I know I hear a lot. I'm sure you hear a lot, too, from MAGA Republicans that we are not ener energy independent, that, you know, the energy situation under President Biden is deplorable when, in fact, um, both in terms of renewables and even fossil fuels. And we are at an unparalleled level of energy independence under the president, even compared to Donald Trump. So I definitely want to point that out as well. You mentioned in your your answer um, that in terms of your transferable skills and in terms of your background, that you're comfortable being adversarial is the expression I would use um, with the opposing party and the opposing party's witnesses. I love that. That is why I am such a big fan of yours, Congresswoman Crockett's Congresswoman or Congressman uh, Jared Moskowitz. I think we have a really robust freshman class of Democrats. And actually, I want to talk about that at length because this has manifested itself in a variety of ways. This freshman class does seem more rhetorically aggressive than ever, any previous class before them. 
Why do you think it's important to, I suppose, be more, I, I don't want to know if combative is the word. I think of that as a, as a positive adjective, but why do you think it's important to be combative, to be adversarial, to stand up and be firm as opposed to, you know, Congressman, you really need to be polite and gentle and kind. You know, what, 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 what I guess, motivates you to go about it this way in your conversations and, and during these hearings? Well, first of all, many of us decided to run for office uh, because of January 6th and because of the threats to our democracy, the threat that Donald Trump and now the Republican Party that he completely controls poses to our traditional and normal and valued way of life. So we are all coming at it to some degree from that perspective, which is we are at an existential crisis right now and we have to stop him and stop them from taking over our country because we will lose our country as we know it. So that is sort of the baseline that many of us uh, come in with. And then the second thing that we are, I think many of us realize is we cannot play by different rules than the Republicans if we are to beat them. And so part of the aggressiveness is that we are giving them some of their own medicine. And they're not used to it from Democrats because Democrats, I think rightly, have traditionally taken the high road and tried to put the institution above uh, partisanship, tried to put the people over party. Um, and we continue to think about everything in that realm, but the the risks are too grave right now. The The concerns uh, for the future of our country uh, just do not allow for us to pursue what Michelle Obama said, you know, when they go low, we go high. We have to beat them at their own game right now and out message them and uh, out fox them and frankly, um, out argue them, out persuade. And uh, at this point, in part because Donald Trump is such a partisan individual, is so caustic, is so uh, aggressive, uh, is so, so in the mud. We just can't cede that whole world to him. And we've got to fight back. And I think that's where certainly Congressman Moskowitz, Congressman Crockett and I and, and uh, you know, Robert Garcia, also another one on the the oversight committee who's uh, been quite aggressive. We all when we've talked about it, we all view this as a critical, critical moment because we know why this impeachment investigation is going forward. It's not because Joe Biden did anything. It's just because Donald Trump wants something to talk about on the campaign trail. And so it has been our job, in our view, to prevent him from being able to do that. And that is what our objective has been. Listen, I, I think that you've been very successful in this respect. And you mentioned, um, you know, uh, Congressman Garcia as well. I'll also note that I think that it has had an energizing influence on um, previous like classes of Democrats. So Congresswoman uh, Cortez, um, Congressman Raskin, Jamie Raskin, who's the ranking member of the Oversight Committee. I mean, AOC has always been a fighter, and I love that, too. But it seems to have you know continued her invigoration. Congressman Raskin, um, who you know is a preeminent constitutional scholar. He is an amazing rhetorician. I've seen more aggression from him as well, and it's been a welcome sight. It's almost like you all Maybe I'm wrong. Is it is it like a feeding off each other sort of thing? Do you feel like you all raise each other's games? Like if you hear, um, you know, Congressman Moskowitz speak, does it elevate your game, Congresswoman Crockett and vice versa? And if you notice that influence that you've had, not just on one another, but also, you know, more tenured Congress people in your party. I hesitate to say that that. We are influencing uh, ranking member Raskin, who is one of the finest members of Congress, is the leader of the oversight committee and has done a fabulous job in guiding us. Um, we all very much look up to him and rely upon him and his staff is excellent and they help us a lot. It has been helpful in one regard, which is that because of the seniority of the committee, um, the the order goes from Jasmine to me to Jared. Mm -hmm. 
And so the three of us are right in a row. And we do talk beforehand about what we're going to uh, touch upon to make sure that we're not um, we're not duplicating efforts. And in fact, the whole committee is pretty well organized in that regard. And that's very important um, so that we can target different aspects. And some of us can play offense. Some of us can play defense. Some of us can get into the facts. Some of us and can get into the politics. Um, some of us can, you know, call out the hypocrisy of everything they're doing, which, you know, could take up an entire hearing itself. <laughs> um, so the uh, that that part of it, I think, has been um, is a nice sort of one, two, three punch at the end of uh, at the end of our our row, but. Um, it really helps to have uh, people like Congressman Raskin. Jerry Connolly is excellent. Um, AOC, obviously, is uh, Katie Porter. I mean, there's so many really, really smart, thoughtful people on that committee that uh, it's a it's a good group. And I think that as the Republicans have tried to manufacture something out of nothing, uh, and certainly no evidence that we've been right there to meet the moment and make sure that they cannot do that. And it appears as if the impeachment investigation is dead. So listen, I, I, I know you hesitate to say it. I will not. I think you guys have had an obvious uh, self, you know, fulfilling and reciprocal uh, energizing influence on one another. You mentioned Representative Connolly. He and, and Representative Moskowitz did something hilarious recently, which was in response to Congressman Reschenthaler proposing that Dulles Airport be renamed after Donald Trump in a in a, just a bewilderingly sycophantic move. Um, Connolly and Moskowitz proposed counter legislation saying, hey, listen, if you want to name a federal building after Donald Trump, there's a federal penitentiary not too far from Mar-a-Lago that I think his name would look great on. I love that. And again, I, I'm just curious if um, if that were by some sort of miracle to make it to the floor, would you sign on to that legislation, Congressman? As fast as I possibly could. Um, <laughs> but that's also, I think, representative of of the aggressiveness that we're trying to bring. And, and Congressman Moskowitz, um, is really, really good at this and understanding what the game is they're trying to play and beating them at their own game. We can also win our own our game, which we do try we we are adamant about doing. And that is that, yes, we will play these partisan games because that's where the majority, the Republicans, are putting us. But we can also and do also emphasize, that we're doing this only because they are doing it. And what we would really like to be doing is actually governing and actually doing the work for the American people. And when you look at the distinction between the difference between the last Congress under Speaker Nancy Pelosi, where her majority was effectively the same as uh, Speaker McCarthy's and Speaker Johnson's in, in the House, and this House of Representatives, you literally have the opposite ends of the spectrum for productivity, for meaningful legislation, and for doing the, whether or not you do the work for the American people. I mean, the the litany of bills that President Biden signed into law in the last Congress with Speaker Pelosi and, and Majority Leader Schumer with very narrow majorities um, is re we're now really seeing the benefits of that. And it's some of the things you're talking about, whether it be energy independence and uh, historic investment in renewable energy or historic investment in semi semiconductor manufacturing to bring manufacturing back here. Of course, the biggest uh, infrastructure bill in, in history um, that is so necessary. And you'll recall Donald Trump used to joke or it became a running joke that every week was infrastructure week. Well, Joe Biden and the Democrats got it done. And it is absolutely essential to, to our country. The list goes on um, because there's so much legislation. In this Congress, they, the Republicans literally cannot fund the government which is Congress's very base level function, which is to fund the government. The Republicans have, have are incapable. They have been incapable of doing it themselves. And so they have needed Democrats to rise above and to do the right thing, which is to fund the government. And so anything they've done, they've needed us because they have a destructive extremist wing of their party 
that wants to burn the whole place down, has no interest in governing. And unfortunately, that wing, which is now not just a wing, it's the majority of their party, controls what goes on in the House. A hundred percent. You know, according to bills passed, it is the second least productive iteration of Congress since the Great Depression um, and only narrowly. It's when especially when you consider that that iteration of Congress during the Great Depression met for a fraction of the time. Right. This is a colossal embarrassment in terms of Republican leadership of the House and also goes to to the colossal disparity in the skill an interest in governing between somebody like Speaker Pelosi versus a Speaker Johnson and McCarthy. All of that is well said. The last thing I'll say in terms of the um, the rhetorical approach you're taking is I just would encourage you to keep doing it. I know there's a lot of people out there who, you know, say, listen, please adopt more of the Michelle Obama ethic. I wish we could do that. But right now, with Republicans in the majority and Democrats ability to push legislation in the House, very limited, given that Republicans have made it abundantly clear they have no interest in working with you because they don't want to give the president a political victory. I think you all are doing the right thing with your time, effort and attention. I applaud you for it. So, well, thanks. And, and, you know, one of the things that I think people should understand is um, it, we all have different roles to play. And there are some uh, Democrats in very, very tough districts who are what we call the majority makers. We need them to win those purple districts so that we can be in the majority. People often don't understand how much the majority controls what happens in the House of Representatives. People often say to me, Well, why can't you just go work with the Republicans and get stuff done? And I have to repeatedly explain to them, I have no control. I have zero control. We have zero control. If they want to work with us, we will work with them. But they have to want to. I cannot force them to do anything because they are in full, full control. They set the agenda, to be clear, to the American people, to anyone watching. It's not to, to, to Congressman the congressman's point. It's not like you all have the ability to push legislation and are electing not to, correct? Correct. They they control the floor. They control all the committees. They control what goes through the committees. They control what comes on the floor for votes. Um, They are in total, total control. In the Senate, there's much more bipartisanship because you really do need 60 to do most things. And right now, we're not nowhere close to either party having 60. So there's there is more power in the minority in the Senate than there is in the House. And so we all have different roles. I'm in a very comfortably Democratic seat. And so part of what my role is and given my background is to get out there and aggressively message and set the message in some respects on these areas where I have particular experience and and expertise. And then other members who, you know, we're not prosecutors and we're not impeachment investigators um, are able to sort of pick up on some of what those of us who are uh, who are more comfortable in that uh, in, in that arena do. While many of my colleagues are really focused on uh, doing everything they need to do to win their election, because if we don't have the majority, we cannot implement all of the different policies that we would like to do. And those are the policies that will truly help the American people. It will truly uh, help as we were talking about, whether it be climate change or gun safety or affordability or prescription drug prices or housing. I mean, all of these programs, uh, universal child care, paid family leave act, I could go down a list and we haven't even gotten to healthcare, but expanding healthcare. I mean, there's so many policy objectives of the Democratic Party that are designed to build the our economy and our country from the bottom up and the middle out. And it's a nice little slogan, but it is really true. And what the Republicans want to do and what Donald Trump did in his last presidency is he gave massive tax breaks to the wealthy. That was his biggest accomplishment. And that's what the Republicans focus on doing that and making sure that they continue to Uh, build oil production and that they can continue to um, uh, make guns more prevalent and more accessible, uh, that they can continue to take away our individual freedoms, including our right to reproductive freedom. The dichotomy is so clear, but we have to have the majority in order to get our policies through. And that's why we all have different roles here in order to do that. 
And I appreciate you clarifying that because I think too often people uh, overestimate the power, the actual power of the minority party. I appreciate you doing that. And like I said, I think you all have been using your time very effectively. So the only real political initiative which has come from this House Republican majority is their debt. They, they want to get President Biden. If it's not via impeachment, then it's also, you know, trying to capitalize on the recent special counsel uh, investigation by a Republican Robert Hur, who ultimately declined to press charges against the president. But Basically, these are the two parallel tracks. Just get Joe Biden politically however they possibly can. You mentioned that the impeachment effort is dead. Um, I have seen, you know, signals in that direction. And yet uh, Congressman James Comer will go in front of Fox News and right wing media and try to prop it up again and blow the dust off it. Um, he actually said recently that when it comes to impeachment, he said, and he name dropped you, he said, Dan Goldman, and he said, Congressman Raskin, that you all are actually hypocrites. You all are colluding with the media to spin disinformation and to undermine the credibility of this legitimate investigation into the president. So I want to give you the opportunity to respond to Mr. Comer and to my viewers who um, who may think that this this investigation is legitimate. Well, the proof is in the pudding, which is that uh, the Republicans do not have the votes to actually support impeachment. And and just think about what that means. They they voted for an impeachment uh, for impeachment to go forward. And that has that was six months ago. Um, and we are here today and the Republicans who almost to a T are desperate for Donald Trump to become president. Donald Trump is desperate for Joe Biden to be impeached. Donald Trump pulls the strings around here for the House Republicans in almost every single way. So just think about the fact that even notwithstanding all of those factors, the Republicans cannot even get around to support impeaching President Biden. And I promise you, if there was one thing that they could hang their hat on, they would. But there literally is not a single verifiable, credible piece of evidence that Chairman Comer has put forward to implicate Joe Biden in any wrongdoing, much less high crimes and misdemeanors. So you don't have to take my word for it. You don't you don't you shouldn't take James Comer's word for it, because at this point he is just desperately trying to avoid um, such serious embarrassment and humiliation by figuring out some off ramp for this disastrous investigation that he he has not only run, but he has promised huge things. Um, just take the Republicans at their word themselves, uh, many of whom have said that they're they haven't seen any evidence of any high crimes and misdemeanors. So what that means is this is 16 months of a purely partisan political exercise that wasted money, that wasted time, uh, that could have been used to do important work in this Congress, but instead was used for this absolutely bogus uh, fishing expedition of, of a uh, investigation that was quite clear all along there was nothing to it. Um, and it even, get, it even gets to the point where Russia recognizes that Chairman Comer is such a dupe that he will do anything to try to get Joe Biden. So Russia then uses an agent here in the United States to plant more false information, which we all know was false. And Chairman Comer and Chairman Jordan were so eager for any dirt that they could find on Joe Biden that they just dove into this Russian disinformation that had been debunked over and over and over again, including during the first impeachment investigation that I led five, almost five years ago. And so it's just been a comedy of errors. But at this point, what is very clear, and I have said this repeatedly, is that if they do continue with this impeachment investigation, uh, given everything we know now, they are doing it as a, a accomplice to Russia and Russia's effort to interfere in our election to help Donald Trump win. That is clear. We know that is happening. We know that was that happened in 2016. We know they tried again in 2020. 
And we now know that they are trying to do it again for 2024. Of course, Vladimir Putin wants Donald Trump to be president. Trump is Putin's puppet. He will let him do whatever he wants. So obviously, they're going to do whatever they can to get Trump in office. And the fact that Republican members of the House of Representatives have bought this hook, line and sinker. And again, I hate saying this, but you don't have to take my word for it, even though I feel very comfortable with everything I'm saying. Listen to the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Mike Turner, the Republican chairman, the Republican chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Michael McCall, both of whom have confirmed that their colleagues in the Republican Party are parroting false Russian propaganda on the House floor. That is how low this party has gone. I appreciate you pointing that all that out because there's so much packed into the this sham impeachment effort. Um, you mentioned, of course, uh, Alexander Smirnov, who um, you know obviously Republicans are engaging in revisionist history right before our very eyes, Congressman. They're saying, listen, you know Smirnov, who was the anonymous confidential human source uh, who filed an, an FD 1023 form alleging that Joe Biden and Hunter Biden received bribes from you know, a Ukrainian energy company. They were unverified allegations that was made very clear in the report. The FBI, um, when they conversed with the Republicans, when this form came to light, they repeatedly stressed these allegations are unverified. And it turns out that the confidential human source Smirnov was busted by the FBI for lying to the FBI in those allegations. My understanding is as well, to be very clear, that he apparently has a strong political bias against President Biden. And during questioning by the FBI, he revealed that the that he was effectively regurgitating uh, disinformation from Russian intelligence. I want to make sure I've got my facts straight on that. Is that a correct assessment of the situation? Yeah, that's pretty much what what I understand. And so now James Comer and others as well are saying, listen, OK, you know, all those times that we said that that was a crucial part of the investigation. Not really. I mean, we really we said that, but we like didn't say that it's it's a crucial, non-crucial part. Does it are you surprised at how blatant the lies are when we have the receipts. I mean, I've I've played them on my channel. Others have done so as well. All the times that Comer and Jordan have said that this form was key. It was a keystone to the investigation into the president. Are you surprised that they're just they're not even trying to be clever about it? They're just saying we didn't say that. We no, we didn't say that. Are you surprised? Chairman Jordan said it was the best evidence of wrongdoing by Joe Biden. Um, look, uh, would I have been surprised 10 years ago? Yes, very. But am I surprised now after hundreds or tens of thousands of lies by Donald Trump, um, where he just gaslights the American people over and over and over and operates in such a, a limited feedback loop on, on the extreme right that no one questions what he says? Some of the data, even just about the 2020 election and the polling is just shocking. 80% of Trump supporters believe that Joe Biden won the 2020 election based on fraud. Right. It is shocking. That has been proven over and over and over again not to be the case. 60 judges dismissed cases or rejected that argument. Um, secretaries of state, Republican and Democrat, Bill Barr, the former Republican attorney general, literally anyone with any degree of objectivity who has looked at this has stated that it was a absolute free and fair election. And despite all of the allegations by Rudy Giuliani and Trump, there's never been any evidence that has been presented that that it was in any way wrong. But 80 percent of his voters just believe him. And so now the House Republicans know all right, I can just lie with impunity because most of the people who watch me on Newsmax or Fox News um, will believe whatever I say, even if what I say is that, you know, the sky is red. And it's um, so I'm not surprised because it has worked for Donald Trump and they see that it works and that they will uh, use that model to for their own benefit. The. The thing that frustrates, well, there are many things that frust many things that frustrate me about this uh, sham impeachment effort against the president. But one of the glaring double standards to me is this idea. And again, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I just want to set the table up here. So 
we have Hunter Biden, President Biden's son, who has only ever been a civilian, right? It's not like he had a role in the Obama White House or even the Biden White House. And he's also been allowed to be investigated and prosecuted by his father's Department of Justice, which as far as I mean, I'm not a father, but to me, just looking at it, that takes an act of superhuman ethics, given the power of the presidency and that President Biden is allowing this to happen. And then you have Jared Kushner, Donald Trump's son-in-law, who did occupy a role in the White House. And I'm a Spider-Man fan, so I believe with great power comes great responsibility. And the idea that we should actually hold government actors to a higher standard of ethics than everyday civilians. Republicans have seemed to, to flip that. Am I missing something? Hunter Biden, a private citizen, is, should, is held by Republicans to a higher standard than Jared Kushner, a former government actor, and really even Donald Trump, the former president of the United States. Am I wrong? Uh, no, you're not only wrong, but it goes even further, which is that Hunter Biden, um, whose only government appointment or other uh, government association was actually to have been appointed to the board of Amtrak by President George W. Bush, um, also has had no business dealings with any foreign governments, notwithstanding what you hear from the Republicans, all of his business dealings that have been investigated related to uh, private companies. The government may have been invested in some of them or had some degree of, uh, of involvement, but it were, they were not government entities that he was doing business with. Meanwhile, Jared Kushner is the head of Middle East policy for the White House, uh, spends an inordinate amount of time in the Middle East uh, with MBS, the the uh, crown, crown prince, of, uh, crown prince of mm -hmm. uh, Saudi Arabia, and within months or even weeks of him leaving his job, MBS overrules his investment advisors and agrees to give two billion dollars of Saudi Arabian government money to a new investment firm to Jared Kushner who has never, ever done this type of investing before. Now, when you look at that and you ask yourself, who should be investigated? Hunter Biden, never a government official, never does business with government, um, persuasive and uh, overwhelming evidence that his father had never had anything to do with any of his business, business ventures. And you compare it to Jared Kushner, who literally used his position in the White House very clearly to solicit and obtain two billion dollars of an investment from a foreign government. Who should be investigated? It's pretty clear it should be Jared Kushner and not Hunter Biden. And yet this Republican Party has so focused on trying to develop campaign fodder for Donald Trump. This is an abuse of congressional authority. There is no, no legitimate congressional purpose to any of this. This is purely to provide campaign fodder for Donald Trump. Uh, they have gone forward with this absolute ridiculous investigation of Hunter Biden because Hunter Biden is being investigated for crimes by the Department of Justice. And since he's not a government official, that's where that investigation should be. There's no basis for Congress to investigate Hunter Biden, a private citizen. So they create this fiction that they're investigating Joe Biden, but they have literally never had any concrete, credible, or verifiable evidence that Joe Biden was involved in any of his son's business dealings. So this was a, it really, as Republicans generally do, it stooped to yet another lower level of deceitfulness, of of real impropriety um, and of abusing the authority uh, that we have here in Congress. A hundred percent. I want to be respectful of your time. I've got three rapid fire questions for you. So number one, um, one thing I hear from people who are um, obsessed with the impeachment effort against the president in a way that they want him impeached or they think Hunter Biden's laptop is the most important phrase in human history. I, I've heard 
the goalpost shift. And one thing that I've been hearing recently is, okay, sure, it's true that the Obama White House and the European community wanted Viktor Shokin, the Ukrainian prosecutor, to be removed from office. But Joe Biden was the one who leveraged foreign aid to do it. That in and of itself is an impeachable offense. The the vector, the mechanism by which the, the vice president tried to pressure Shokin's removal. Do you find any substance to that? None at all. This this type of negotiation happens all of the time in diplomatic circles and foreign policy around the world. Joe Biden was executing official U.S. policy that was supported by the EU, the IMF, by Republican senators, including Ron Johnson, who's now the biggest uh, Burisma conspiracy theorist out there. They wrote a letter. They wrote Absolutely. a letter. Absolutely. Yeah. They wrote a letter encouraging Ukraine to fire uh, Victor Shokin. And the reason why they wanted to fire Shokin is because he was not investigating and prosecuting corruption at companies like Burisma. And why that actually, that move by Joe Biden was actually bad, potentially bad. I don't know if it uh, materialized, but potentially bad for Hunter Biden's business ventures because. If he removed the corrupt prosecutor who was not investigating corruption and they put in somebody who was a legitimate prosecutor investigating corruption, then there was a much greater chance that Burisma and the the founder of Burisma, who was a former government official in Ukraine, would be investigated for corruption. And in fact, that is what happened. So Mm -hmm. Joe Biden's uh, decision to push forward with unanimous official policy of uh, all of the Democratic allies to remove Shokin because he was not prosecuting corruption uh, was bad for his son. So it wasn't even that, oh, it's helpful to his son. It was bad for Hunter Biden. And the Republicans know that. That was demonstrated over and over again in our impeachment investigation in, in 2019 and the Senate investigation. Uh, Every single Ukraine and Russia expert uh, in our government said the same thing. And yet they uh, they just wanted to ignore it because it was not to their political benefit. In terms of political benefit, recently, uh, James Comer and Jim Jordan have demanded that the Department of Justice turn over the audio files and the conversation between special counsel Robert Herr and the president, even though they have the transcript. The Department of Justice refused, saying that there's no legitimate legitimate uh, legislative purpose to this. Um, What do you make of the DOJ's decision and Republicans response to it, where they demand the files anyway? Well, they're going to demand until, you know, the cows come home. And at some point, you just have to call their bluff. Uh, I mean, remember, this is a chairman, Jim Jordan, who refused to comply with his own congressional subpoena. Apparently, a congressional subpoena to him is not valid, but anyone that he issues to anyone else has to be uh, responded to and and uh, complied with in whole cloth or there's going to be contempt. You know, the hypocrisy knows no bounds. But no, there's there's no use for the audio if you have the transcript other than for political purposes. So you agree that the DOJ made the right call there? Absolutely. And I think Mm -hmm. their, their rationale says that, that they there is no they they have identified no legitimate purpose for why they would need the audio in addition to the transcript that relates to Congress's oversight role or legislative uh, legislative purposes. I appreciate that. Last question, Congressman, you'll get the final word on this. What are the stakes for this election? If, if a viewer is watching and he or she is undecided on how to vote and they're an eligible voter, can you make a sales pitch on why people should vote Democrat in 2024? Well, there are two reasons. Uh, one is, when you look at the chaos and dysfunction and ineptitude of this Republican House of Representatives, especially as you compare it to the last one under Democratic control, you see only one party that can actually govern and that can actually do the work for the American people. On the other hand, by the way, that was led by President Biden. On the other hand, if Donald Trump becomes president, and I know this sounds like hyperbole, and I know sometimes I think, God, I, you know, th- this sounds kind of crazy to think. 
we will not have our democracy as we know it. He will pull us out of all of our international agreements, trade, uh, defense, security. He will pull us out of NATO. He will expel um, uh, um, people who are here from countries that he doesn't like, mostly the uh, reenactment, but on a much grander scale of the Muslim ban that he did. He will take away people's rights to uh, women's rights to uh, abortion. Uh, I do not believe him from one second that he will not sign a national abortion ban. He said it in 2017. He is a inveterate liar. You cannot trust a single thing that he says. And all he will say anything for political purposes. You have to look at what he has done in the past when it's not necessarily the his political life at stake. Um, and one thing that doesn't get talked about enough is that he will completely undermine our government as we know it by removing all of the career civil servants, all of the hundreds of thousands of people in the executive branch, our diplomats, our intelligence officials, our military officials, everybody who does the work for this country that implements our laws, that executes our laws, that um, make sure that we have our, our proper foreign policy and that there's global security and stability. He will remove all those people and put in political appointees who will pay a loyalty oath. So he will weaponize the Department of Justice to prosecute his enemies. And I would not be surprised if I am one of them. Uh, he will weaponize intelligence for his own political purposes, which is completely anathema to the purpose of our intelligence. He will undermine all of our relationships with our allies, and he will cater to dictators. He will allow Vladimir Putin to run wild. The, the list, the parade of horribles gets longer and longer and longer. And on the other hand, you have someone, Joe Biden, uh, who has demonstrated an incredible ability not in the last Congress to legislate and to pass really, really significant, important legislation to correct our economy after COVID, uh, to bring prices of prescription drugs down, to bring uh, generally prices down, down to grow jobs, uh, and to really focus on the, the middle class and building that middle class. And in this in this uh, term, he has demonstrated such a steady hand at the helm of a ship as it relates to foreign policy. First in Ukraine, where he rallied our allies in ways that people don't realize, so that Europe has really been leading the support for Ukraine, and we have been helping and we need to help more, um, but also in managing an incredibly complicated and dangerous geopolitical situation in the Middle East. And I'm not even just talking about the war in Gaza, but with Iran, with Hezbollah to the north, which is a much more powerful organization than Hamas is in Gaza. And he has been able to manage this with uh, the experience that only someone like he, who's been in government for 50 years, can have. And don't underestimate, yes, there's no question he's old. Absolutely no question he's old, he will say it. Um, but with age also comes a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience. And I and many of my colleagues have seen that firsthand. Um, it's hard sometimes to relay to the public how that is, uh, but it is, uh, I, I assure you that we have very, very steady leadership with Joe Biden and that we will not have a democracy if Donald Trump is president. That's a pretty compelling case to me. Congressman, I could talk to you for hours. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for everything. Hopefully we'll get to do this again and talk in depth about other topics as well. Thank you very much. You have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Josiah. Great to be with you.